Good morning. My name is Jonathan Gildard. I'm a person in long-term recovery. What that means for me is I haven't found it necessary to take a drink or use a drug since, since November 19th of 2013. And I, I love doing this panel. I get the opportunity. I, I get the opportunity to work with some of the people uh, who are up on this panel uh, with the state agencies in my position with Oxford House as a contract specialist. Um, so I get to work with them a little more than, you know, on, on a daily basis. Um, real quick, we're just going to go through a few announcements, a few reminders. Um, so again, welcome to the 2022 World Convention um, in Seattle. It's been a long time coming. Uh, lanyards and name badges are required to enter all sessions. So make sure that you keep that with you. Don't lose it. You need it to get in. Um, please silent your cell phones um, during the breakout panels. Uh, there's always one. So let's make sure we silence those now um, so we don't have any interruptions. Uh, no side conversations, please. If you do need to have a conversation, please step out to show respect to the panelists. Uh, please don't smoke or vape near any entrances. That is a city ordinance, so please make sure we're respecting that. Uh, dispose of cigarette butts properly and safely. No littering. Pick up after yourself. Let's show them how, you know, how we do it here at Oxford House. Uh, take notes during the session um, and, and relay this information back to your houses, your chapters, your state associations. And then keep your questions, if you could, till the end. We're going to leave a little bit of time, about 10 to 15 minutes, so... Uh, we can answer some of your, so that our panelists can answer some of your questions as well. So this is the working with state agencies and other organizations panel. So hopefully you're in the right spot. Uh, expand, this, this panel is about the expansion of Oxford House network of houses has occurred fast where Oxford House has a close working relationship with the state agencies, designated behavioral health contractor and local treatment providers. Expansion is particularly strong where a state has financially supported both a startup revolving loan fund and on-site technical assistance. Uh, this panel will discuss how Oxford House Inc. and these various entities can work together successfully. Additionally, the group will consider what has been working and how the program staff have overcome specific challenges to such partnerships. From the standpoint of partnering agencies, what could Oxford House be doing better uh, to increase support uh, throughout the country. To what extent do NIMBY issues and occasional overdose incidents and deaths discourage support? Uh, what's working well and what isn't working well with various relationships in the panel includes representatives from organizations with which Oxford House Inc. has been working with uh, for, for quite a long time. So, uh, so we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, first up, we have Adam Trosper, who I've had the pleasure to work with uh, in the state of Kentucky for uh, many years now, since I moved out there, I originally, you know, started here in Washington State and moved out to Kentucky as an outreach worker. Um, and he is now the state opiate coordinator with the Kentucky Opioid Response Efforts. So, Adam, welcome. Help me welcome Adam Trosper. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Oxford House, for allowing me to be here again. Um, I've been coming to this and speaking on this panel for a few years now and so obviously I'm doing something right or just the fact that the the pool is shallow and they just keep hollering for me um, but as Jonathan said my name is Adam Trosper and I am an advocate for people in recovery from behavioral health mental health substance use issues uh, and also as he said I am the state opioid coordinator uh, with the Kentucky opioid response effort which CORE, or Kentucky Open Response Effort, is our SOAR funded guided uh, program through SAMHSA, wherein we use a recovery oriented system of care framework that implements a comprehensive targeted response to the Commonwealth's opioid and stimulant crisis by expanding access to a full continuum of high quality and evidence based prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery services and supports in high-risk geographic regions of our state and of those programs it includes Oxford House. So prior to taking the role that I am in now I served as a program administrator working with Oxford House and I began in 2015 with the state in that capacity and when I started we had four houses in one area of our state 
Oxford House had had a presence since the late 80s when we were able to start a revolving loan fund. And at the beginning of that process, I met with my predecessor, I learned about the program, and I began to immediately hit the ground running. I was going to recovery meetings, I was going to treatment programs, I was going to recovery centers, and just trying to sell this program in order to get people to open more houses. And I quickly realized that didn't work. Uh, as I said, I'm an advocate for people in recovery. I'm not a person in long-term recovery myself. And, you know, just couldn't figure out what's wrong. What's happening? Why is this, why is this not working in our state? And after some time, it came to the realization that we needed to work more directly with Oxford. And so in conversations with Kathleen Gibson uh, and others within Oxford House, uh, we worked out a relationship to provide some seed funding for Oxford to provide us with outreach staff. And so in 2016, we began an expansion project wherein we had one outreach staff assigned to the state of Kentucky. And in that time, we have now reached 105 houses with over 700 recovery beds across our state. And I've wanted to do this every year, and I always, I always never am prepared enough to do it. Uh, but I want to recognize the outreach staff that we have in the state, because if it wasn't for outreach, we would not have the network and capacity of recovery housing in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And those names are Emily Cato, Brittany Allen, Gary Gardner, Brent Welsh, Will Fox, Savannah Schweinhart, Craig Mitchell, Lindsey Smith, Susan West, Brittany Carmichael, Bobby Joe Miller, Jessica Bland, John Hayes, Tara Fox, Christopher Reiser, and Jeffrey Gizmo Pemberton. So thank you to our outreach staff. Now, we're here to talk about partnering with state agencies. And so what I'm gonna just give you very briefly is just a few things that I've learned along the way um, in working with the state of Kentucky and fostering this partnership that we have. And I'm a very big person with pop culture. I love to watch a lot of television. I love to watch a lot of movies. And um, something that always comes to my mind, is anybody familiar with uh, the television show How I Met Your Mother, yeah. right? Um, while some of those things on that show, looking back on it now, may be a little problematic, but there's one concept uh, that Neil Patrick Harris's character comes up with around dating, and he, call, he says, be there. When they go to this place, be there. When they go to this place, be there. And I really like that idea as we apply it to increasing capacity of Oxford House. Where there's a stakeholder meeting, be there where there is a QRT or quick response team in a community, be there. Where there's a reentry council, be there. The biggest part of this is building relationships with the stakeholders across your state and in your small communities. And if you're not there, if you're not present, they don't see you, they don't hear from you, they don't learn from you. And they won't be able to fully understand the benefit that Oxford House can have in providing a safe and supportive living environment for individuals in recovery. And something else with regards to building relationships, especially with state government, is the fact that don't get bogged down with the bureaucracy. I answer a lot of phone calls in our state, people looking for treatment providers, looking for issues with insurance and various different things. Even though I don't do some of the things that I assist with on my daily basis, I am a person that will do anything to point people in the right direction. And while those Individuals may be few and far between in some areas. Find that person. I think oftentimes we shoot for the stars, right? When we're looking for, for partnerships and finding people, we may reach out to a governor's office, we may reach out to a commissioner, we may reach out to a secretary, director of a department for behavioral health. And I'm not to say that those people aren't listening and they don't care, but they're oftentimes very busy. But there is somebody in that in that cog, in that wheel that is there that will listen to you and will help you find the resources. And so please do not get discouraged if you send an email or you make a phone call and it doesn't get returned. Move on to the next person. I do that all the time. And one of the examples that I always give is I used to work with uh, faith-based organizations in our state 
and still do to a certain extent. And oftentimes we would reach out to senior ministers and, and pastors of churches and never hear anything back. But I guarantee you there was somebody in that church that really cared about people in recovery. And so that's what I began to ask about. Does your church have a recovery ministry rather than saying this is who I am? Let's learn from, that, learn from those folks. That's one of the first questions you can lead with is what do you do? And that opens that door and opportunity for them to ask you the same question. Another thing, whenever you get those opportunities, sell the evidence base. Oxford House is the only evidence-based recovery housing model in the United States. And utilize that. People need to understand that folks that go through Oxford House have been proven to maintain recovery longer than folks that go through perhaps more traditional pathways of recovery. It's a model that works. I also encourage folks to learn the language of recovery. You know, we are here, I, I, I tell folks all the time, one of my favorite things to do in my job is to go to the Oxford House World Convention. I walk away from this place just feeling rejuvenated and empowered, being around you all and hearing from everybody. And you, we, you know, we come into these spaces and we, we share our stories of recovery, or you all share your stories of recovery. And you know, I'm not to say that the language of recovery that you utilize in your pathway is not appropriate. That's not the case at all. But when you're speaking with audiences you know, that are stakeholders and organizations, you know, Jonathan, you gave a beautiful example of how to announce yourself as a person in long-term recovery. It adds credence. It lets people know that you've gotten beyond this space of addiction and substance use, and now you're living a life that is empowering to you. And use that to empower others. Okay. I got told I got one minute, so let me hurry up. In that, in that note, your lived experience adds a strong credibility to the work that you're doing. But I also encourage you to look into the research. Get the data. You folks in, in recovery out there beating the bushes to, to increase the capacity of Oxford House, you are so unique that you can bring together the qualitative and quantitative research and from your own lived experiences as well as that partnership with data. And that's something that nobody in recovery can, or nobody that's not in recovery can. My final few notes here, I'll wrap up really quickly, is I encourage you all, if your house does not already do so, seek out and obtain Narcan training and Narcan in your homes. When you're out meeting with stakeholders, that's another thing that you can sell, is that we are prepared in the instance that an overdose occurs. Another thing, and I really appreciate Vet Torres's comment earlier around this idea of kicking folks out versus helping them out. And I recognize that that's a principle of Oxford House, that if you, if you return to substances, then you are dismissed from the home. But I know within the state of Kentucky and I know in other states, the focus becomes getting out there and helping those folks get re-engaged in treatment, re-engaged in recovery. You don't just kick people out. I don't think I've ever really met in a person with Oxford House that just says that I'm not willing to help that person when that time comes. And so make sure you point that out for folks. They want to know that you're beyond this idea of of people cannot find recovery even if they may have perhaps lost it for a brief period of time. And so with that, I want to say thank you, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be up here again today, and I look forward to meeting and talking to various ones of you throughout the rest of the time here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Adam. Uh, next up, we have Linda, Linda McCorkle. She is the Director of Treatment and Recovery Services for the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services uh, in the division in, in the, <clears throat> excuse me, she received a uh, Bachelor's of Science from Middle Tennessee State University in 1975 with a major in psychology and sociology and a minor in secondary education. She has worked for the state of Tennessee for 45 years. 
and she started her career in the Department of Corrections, where she worked in counseling and prison management. She began working in the uh, in the excuse me. She began working in the area of substance abuse in 1992 as a mental health and program specialist, and has been the director of treatment services since 2011. She is responsible for the oversight of the federal block grant funding for treatment, as well as other specialty grants and programs. She serves on many committees, both locally and nationally, and is the National Treatment Network representative. So please help me welcome Linda McCorkle. Thank y'all. Um, you know, I went through two and a half years and didn't get COVID. And then two weeks ago, I got COVID. So I've got a little lingering congestion here, so just bear with me. But anyway, thank you for those opening remarks. And so I would be remiss if I didn't say anything about Mr. Malloy. Um, he was just a special man. And just like they said this morning, you would see him at the different uh, sessions. He and Jane would be there. She'd be taking pictures. And um, the one word that really comes to my mind was authentic. He was just authentic. They were both full of joy. And I have no doubt that Kathleen will carry on this tradition beautifully. But anyway, for those that have never met Mr. Malloy, you missed a great man. So do, I think this afternoon, they're going to show some of the video clips. So do, do see those because he was very special. So, uh, like you said, I oversee um, substance abuse treatment and recovery programs across the state. That includes our federal block grant programs, discretionary grants such as our state opioid response grant. Um, you know, for many years, you know, our focus was on clinical treatment. Um, that's, that's where the bulk of it, you know, was. Uh, back, and some of this is in my slides, so I'll, we'll look at it again, but just as an overview, so many years ago through Access to Recovery, we were able to begin re providing recovery support services, which include transitional housing. And so we've been able to build upon that. And, you know, I kind of think of it like a puzzle. You know, you've got clinical treatments, you've got medication assisted treatment, and here, here, here. But I think one of the big components, of course, is housing. Um, I think that's truly uh, one of the big components. And um, so we'll just go ahead with the slides and then I'll... So if you're living in an Oxford house, congratulate yourself. And if you, you know, you may say why. Well, because there's connection, support, sobriety, employment, and quality of life. And um, how many have been in living in an Oxford house for a year? Good. So that's, that's a good number of you. So I, I would encourage all of y'all, especially if you're new to Oxford House, you know, keep it up. I know that, you know, living with other people can get kind of wonky, but, you know, give people grace. You know, we've all got a lot of baggage. So look for those good qualities in folks and, you know, know that what you're doing, it, it's, you know, it is an evidence-based practice, just like Adam said. And, you know, the one of the things I was thinking about with evidence-based practices, you know, there are other ones, motivational interviewing, all those things. But have you ever seen a conference with people who've been in motivational interviewing that come to a conference together? You know, no, you know, you know, so applaud being a part of Oxford House because it is special. Um, we know that a safe, having a safe, supported place to live is a key to long-term recovery. I truly believe that. You can be in clinical treatment and get out. If you, if you don't have a safe place to go, you know what? I, you know, I think your chances are slim. Um, on SAMHSA's website, they have the affordable housing model. Um, you know, they, they partner along with the National Association of Recovery Residences, which is NAR. NAR gives uh, categories of housing. And so for Oxford House, that's a level one which is independent type living. And so I'm not going to read all those words, but, you know, <clears throat> they do rank housing there. Um, there's also research that shows benefits of recovery housing models and recovery community centers help to provide stability, safety, support, and a hope for a better future. 
So um, our state, again, like I said, started providing transitional living under the Access to Recovery. Um, this was through recovery support providers. The, this type of housing is paid for, but on a limited basis. So we do fund a network of 112 addiction recovery programs, is what we call them. Um, we provide for transitional housing through those, through those programs, but it's usually for a month or two. It's not ongoing, but it is a way to help people um, get that connection started. We also have what's called a Creating Homes Initiative through our department, uh, which works with local communities to educate, inform, and expand quality, safe, affordable, and permanent housing options for people with mental illness and co-occurring disorders. They have been instrumental in being able to fund some of our addiction recovery programs to help them to um, renovate houses and things like that. They most recently have had a phone call with Marty Walker. Many of y'all know Marty. Uh, we love Marty in Tennessee, so they've recently had a phone call with Marty and some others with Oxford House about the possibility of maybe there being investors and so forth who would apply for this funding to, um, to then rent those houses to Oxford House. So we're hopeful that this, this is another connection where we'll get more houses in Tennessee. Um, we're in our 10th year of contracting with Oxford House uh, to provide out to outreach workers. Um, kind of like Adam said, many years ago, uh, when I first started with our department 30 years ago, we had the revolving loan funds. And so at that time, we had six houses. Uh, many of y'all saw James McClain this morning. He and his brother, his brother Milton, lived in Tennessee. So they partnered together, and they were able to open six houses. Um, we, we provided that revolving phone line, revolving loan fund, excuse me, um, but it didn't go any further than that. You know, they didn't expand. They did stay around, though, um, so we were, we were happy about that. But anyway, we were fortunate several years back, 10 years to be specific, to have a commissioner who really believed in... Um, more bang for the buck is, was kind of what he said. So he had heard about Oxford House. Um, he really wanted to know more about it. He tasked us with, uh, you know, contacting different states to get their opinion. Uh, we did. We talked to Oxford House, and so it went from there. We started with two outreach workers. Um, they saw the success there. They called him in, the commissioner and assistant commissioner at the time. They said, you know, they went out of the room for a few minutes. They came back. They said, we found some more funding. We want to have at least two more workers right now. So uh, you need someone who really has that vision and commitment. Um, our assistant commissioner at the time, who is now our commissioner, um, had worked in mental health as far as opening houses for those with mental health issues. And so she was very familiar with that process, and it was part of her heart as well. So I'm just fortunate we've been able to continue this. Got to move on here. Um, we uh, have seven plus outreach workers right now, one dedicated to the criminal justice population. We have 137 houses, 998 beds, 84 for men, 53 for women. Uh, one of the um, areas that we really love for housing are the 14 houses for women and three for men with children. Um, I heard this morning Washington State had like a huge number. So we've got, we've got our work cut out for us there. But we do include Oxford House in all our pertinent meetings and trainings. Um, they have a presence on our website. We've connected them with our regional overdose prevention specialists to receive training regarding overdose and the use of naloxone. Um, I was able to be at the uh, Tennessee Convention this year. They had someone there who talked about it. Um, so we've, that's been a great part of that as well. We were able to expand outreach workers through our more recent substance abuse block grant, additional COVID funding. So that's been a great thing. Um, again, I've already talked about it being evidence-based. It is a true partnership, you know. I don't have to worry about it. If there's any not in my backyard stuff, which is very rare that I hear of, all I have to do is contact Marty and it's taken care of. 
You know, they'll bake some cookies, take them to the, the folks next door. They'll go mow their yard. I've heard all these kinds of stories. But anyway, they're neighbors. Um, and that's most important. They're really good neighbors. Uh, one of the, the really good things about my job is I get the monthly report. And I love getting the monthly report because it shows me the number of houses, it, you know, if they've got some in the pipeline. It also talks about... Um, chapter meetings and the fun things they're doing. So there is a session on fun, and I don't know, Marty is a part of that session. Go to that, because it is really good to have fun while living in Oxford House. And so they give you ideas on activities and things to do. So um, anyway, there's that. Here's a map of our Oxford houses across the state. Um, it's grown. And um, this is a folk, This is a picture of some folks from a couple of years ago, I believe, at our one of our conventions. So anyway, just thank y'all. Um, hope you have a good rest of your conference, and you can let me know if you have questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Linda. So next up, we have uh, Suzanne Williams. Uh, she has a master's in criminal justice from New Mexico State University and a bachelor's of arts in sociology from Northwestern Oklahoma State University with 26 years of professional experience in behavioral health and cri the criminal justice field. She serves as director of recovery, support, employment, and housing for Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. She leads an amazing team that focuses on homeless housing runaway and homeless youth efforts and supported employment. Her innovative collaborative efforts have led to her currently serving as chair of the Oklahoma Governor's Interagency Council on Homelessness and sitting on several national committees as well. So please help me welcome Suzanne Williams. Good morning, and it is a privilege to be here. It is my first time sitting on this panel for Oxford House, so thank you for the invitation. Um, and I see some of uh, Okies in the house in our, in our Oklahoma <laughs> shirts. Um, but where is, um, I just wanna give you a little bit of perspective of what um, uh, ODMH SAS, I refer to it as DMH is in the state of Oklahoma. We're the single state authority on behavioral health and substance abuse. Um, where my team falls is we're kind of that bridge between all the other services across the state. We don't fall under our mental health. We don't fall under substance abuse. We're kind of that bridge because we do all housing, including uh, recovery housing. So this is kind of a timeline because I thought this would be a really good perspective of how we got to where we are today with Oxford House. And we started in 2006. We had a contract with Oxford House to fund two outreach workers um, using uh, substance abuse block grant funding. And so we started out with those two. We had a liaison at the department. Um, it, um, many of you, if you've been around a while, know who that is. It's Ray Caesar. He is the one and only Ray. He has lived experience. He um, has done, really set the groundwork for Oxford House in the state of Oklahoma. Um, he took a really gr um, grassroots approach he helped find the houses, he helped open the houses, um, he was in the houses, um, and that was his world really at the Department of Mental Health is to be that really support from a statewide level, but in really building it across the state. Um, in 2012, we held the Oxford House um, This World Convention in 2012, and then in 2018, Ray decided to retire. And he had jumped around his um, Oxford House and what he was doing with Oxford House had jumped around throughout our state agency. If you're familiar with state agencies, we have lots of divisions and sometimes we switch what division we fall under just depending on who our commissioner is. And so he had switched throughout the years of Oxford House being under criminal justice for a few years. It was under provider cert for a few years, under substance abuse for a few years. And so when he uh, retired and, and told um, the commissioner he was retiring in 2018, she then reached out to me and said, Suzanne, guess what? Now you're over Oxford House. Get with Ray and make it work. And so um, I, I am not a person in long-term recovery. And so I um, immediately reached out to, and it was a pretty quick transition because he had 
Ray had built out a whole bunch of time off, so it was as we do in the state agencies when we retire, we may retire at a certain date, but the three or four months leading up to that date, we are probably not in the office because we have to use all of our time off. Um, and so I didn't really have a chance to talk to Ray, um, passing of the torch, so to speak. And so I uh, reached out to Dan and Jackson with Oxford House. Dan was the lead for Oklahoma and Jackson Regional and said, hey, can I meet with you? Um, I'm the new person. I'm your new Ray. And I know I have big shoes to fill because I am, am not a person in long-term recovery, which they had been used to. I said, and so I came in with a different skill set. And, and we met, and I uh, took a different approach. I wasn't the grassroots, in the house type of person, because that's not really well where my skill set is. But I told um, Oxford House, I said, hey, I want to learn. Take me under your wing. Embrace me. And I, I want to build your trust before we can move forward, because I know that that's not easy. Um, especially, I'm not clinical either, so that was probably a good thing. I'm not from the treatment side. I, I, I um, am not a therapist or LADC or any of that either. I come from really a different approach. And, and so they did. Oxford House embraced me. In fact, they embraced me so much. They had me do their welcome about in February of that of, 28, of 2019 for their state convention. <laughs> and said, hey, go up, you're doing the welcome, uh, and uh, you're part of it. So I tremendously appreciated that, because if I did not have the support from the Oxford House outreach workers, I couldn't do the work I do today. Um, I, like I said, I have a really different approach, and where my skill set lends is being very collaborative and working with other state agencies and partners across the state. And so what I began doing is building relationships and being that bridge for Oxford House to the Department of Corrections, to drug courts, to get the Governor's Interagency Council on Homelessness, because we know Oxford House, if it wasn't for Oxford House, many of you would be homeless. So I know I needed them on board too, to bring the, those partners in from the homeless service providers uh, with HUD's continuum of care, which is where all the funding for housing and homelessness drops in the state of Oklahoma. Be part of your COC if you're not already, um, and I can help connect you in your state. And just with our provider network across the state, really making sure that they supported Oxford House and made those appropriate referrals to Oxford House. Um, and then, in 2020, um, things were moving, and and I really wanted to be that advocate and that voice for Oxford House. Um, and so we actually back up in 2019, as soon as I um, be came into the recovery housing space, um, I knew that they we had about 100, 110 Oxford houses, but I knew we had many more mom and pop recovery homes across the state. So we did an environmental scan to see how many were in the state of Oklahoma uh, because we had had historical problems with recovery housing, with um, use and abuse of those coming in. Um, we had chicken farms, we had the pig farms, all of that sort of thing going on in the state of Oklahoma. And individuals were being referred to these inappropriate recovery housing. Again, not Oxford House, but the other recovery housing. And we ended up finding out there was a little under 400 recovery homes on any given day in the state of Oklahoma. And some of them doing great work, the majority of them not doing such great work. And so it was my mission to be an advocate to change that. Well, by state statute in the state of Oklahoma, the Department of Mental Health has no oversight to recovery housing. Zero, zilch, zip. I couldn't do anything from that perspective um, unless it was treatment, and we know that recovery housing isn't treatment, it's recovery supports. Um, and so how could I be that voice? Well, I went to our um, commissioner and uh, advocated and said we need to have some standards. Uh, even though we can't have the standards, we need to make sure that we're supporting Oxford House and then amazing things that they're doing and not because sometimes it gets uh, watered down when you look at the other recovery housing. And, and, and it, from the treatment perspective, they don't want to make referrals there because they lump all of you all in the same thing. Um, and so we did, in 2020, I'm happy to announce, on July 1st, 
um, the new fiscal year of 2020, we put it in all state contracts. So that means anybody that has a state contract with the state of Oklahoma, whether you're doing treatment or a drug court provider or a mental health provider, it's one statement into our policies that says all housing referrals must be to Oxford House, NAR certified, or DMH approved. It was pretty, because we knew we couldn't do it by state statute, but we have control over who we contract with and to make sure that they're referring individuals to safe, affordable, and appropriate housing, whatever that may look like for them, but that we had control. It had to be NAR certified, had to be Oxford House, or had to be DMH approved. Um, and also in 2020, we got a significant a more portion of the SOR funding. We launched recovery housing scholarships. And so to date, um, with that funding, we have been able to give a one-month scholarship in the amount, a little under 800,000 to Oxford House residents. So that is pretty amazing. Um, we, and I knew that we didn't want to mess with the milieu of recovery housing because I know that it's important that everything goes through that through the house, and so I worked with Oxford House Outreach Workers and said, how can we do this? I wanna make sure if they need that funding, that they get that funding, and, and so we decided to do it in-house. So for Oxford House, they don't apply online. There's an online, you can go to our website and you can see the Recovery Housing Scholarship, but for Oxford House, um, they just ask their house president for an indigent form, they complete it, and then the house votes on it to determine if they you know, are deserving of a Recovery Housing Scholarship, because we did not want to, with our other ones, we can say, hey, they've gotten it, there's a whole process. But for Oxford House, I did not want to um, really, Oxford House works, so why get into that space? Oxford House can decide what to do. Okay. I, two minutes. Uh, so in 2021, we have recovery housing vouchers. That's through HUD funding. I can tell you more about that later because I have a very short time now. Um, let's see. And then where we are today. Um, today, we um, have out eight outreach workers. They are amazing. Um, we have given the revolving loan completely over to Oxford House. I, I really just submit emails. Oxford House takes care of everything on the re uh, revolving loan fund. Uh, we have braided funding to make sure that we're, um, and w we need more outreach workers. I, um, my goal is to have at least one or two more to get those rural areas that we're still not covering. Um, but we braid, so if you're from a state agency uh, or you need to go back and talk to your state agency, you don't have to have one pot of money. I braid, substance abuse block grant, HUD funding, um, SAMHSA funding, and our state funding together to make it work. And so that's the only way we can make it work um, in the state of Oklahoma. Work with your governor's interagency council on homelessness, their equivalent, all states have one. Please reach out to them. Um, in fact, Oxford House is hosting the very first um, December meeting for the Governor's Interagency Council on Homelessness because we know, or I'm the chair, so I get to kind of pick who who gets to be hosting. And so I, uh, so I have the privilege of that. And I'm like, you guys need to know about um, about Oxford House and know the importance of where it plays in the continuum of care for homelessness. Get to know your continuum of care. That's the HUD funding. They have. I'm not saying set aside funding, but recovery housing can be. Um, be the piece, get a piece of that pie and that funding that's coming down. Um, in the state of Oklahoma, our recovery housing do not participate as much as, well, very little in the COCs because same-o, same-o, but get to know your continuum of care. And really, at the end of the day, um, you guys are the expert, my outreach workers. I call them mine, even though I really, I'm not part of Oxford House, but I refer to them as mine all, all the time. They do the work. I am just their advocate and cheerleader at the end of the day. And I think from a state agency perspective, we have to, you have to find the right person at your state agency because sometimes we think we know best because we're the state agency, but I, uh, you know, I've told them I don't know. I'm not the subject matter expert in Oxford House and recovery housing, but what I am good at is getting all the people at the table, and sharing the passion and the and for recovery community, and being their advocate and their cheerleader, and um, making sure they have all they all the support they need in the state. So thank you. All right, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, 
and I can say that it, you know, it's a pleasure I get the opportunity to work with Suzanne on a, on a basis because I work with a contract out there in Oklahoma. Um, next up, we have Amy Maudlin, uh, who is the head of housing with Trillium Health Resources out in North Carolina. Let me just step up. I'm in this weird... I'm in this really weird age where I have five pairs of glasses all over the place, so I'm going to have to use these, my cheap $1 ones. So my name's Amy Maudlin. I'm from North Carolina. Trillium is a um, local management entity. We cover 28 counties in the eastern part of the state, so from the Virginia border all the way down to the South Carolina border right along the coast. So as you can imagine, we get hit with a lot of hurricanes. Um, we've had a lot in the last couple of years. Oxford House has been particularly hit hard um, by Florence. Um, anyway, so Trillium is, we're a local management entity, which means we fall under the North Carolina Division of Health and Human Services, then the Division of Mental Health Substance Abuse, then us to kind of give you a perspective of where we are with state agencies. We um, get local, federal, and state funds. So our money comes from Medicaid, state funds for people who aren't eligible for Medicaid. We're going through a major uh, Medicaid transformation right now. So kind of that funding and who's eligible for it's up in the air. But it seems like we go through that in mental health um, every couple years anyway. So our responsibility, we don't do services directly, but our responsibility is to connect individuals and families to help them get the help they need when they need it. We're responsible, again, for managing state and federal funded services for people who receive Medicaid or are uninsured or cannot afford services. Again, do not provide correct direct care. Instead, we work collaboratively with other agencies like the Oxford House, nonprofits, other governmental agencies, medical providers, hospitals, to create a holistic system of care. So that's the big change that's going on in North Carolina with Medicaid transformation. We'll be, instead of just behavioral health and substance use, we'll be the whole person care for those people that um, have the most severe needs. So this is a huge, will be pharmacy, vision, physical, on top of behavioral health. So that's supposed to go live for us in December. So this particular project, um, Trillium combined our experiences and resources with the vision for sober living for Oxford House to create a unique and model, uh, model that increases sober living options for people in Eastern North Carolina. So before Trillium's um, relationship with Oxford House wasn't a direct relationship. The state would call, the state had a contract with Oxford House and they would call us and say, hey, Amy, because um, I was head of housing, will you go down to Oxford House in Greenville and do a walkthrough, check off you know, how the house looks on this form and send it to me. So that was pretty much my whole relationship with Oxford House. Didn't know anything about recovery, didn't even know there was an Oxford House or such a model. So fast forward to 2015, so I've got that just kind of that little parallel relationship with Keith and tour in Oxford houses. Um, Trillium came up, not me, I wish it had been me, um, came up with the idea for a 2020 vision for recovery. So our original contract started in July of 2015 with the goal of 20 new houses outside the state contract. The state has a separate contact with, contract with Oxford House. This was just Trillium. We wanted to open 20 new houses throughout Trillium's catchment area by June 2020. So we know what happened before June 2020 got here. <laughs> um, the majority of the funding covers staff and startup funds, including rent and utility deposits and furniture with the goal of stabilizing the new home as quickly as possible. So this is not a revolving loan fund. This is just funding to help the house get started, period. They don't have to pay it back. Um, in addition, the plan includes a resource development to support residents of the Oxford houses. Um, that person goes and looks for houses to convert into Oxford houses. Once a house is located, they work on opening the house. That means, you know, any structural changes that need to be done to the home in order to accommodate the residents. They buy furniture, paint, all that stuff. Kind of all the fun stuff, I think. <laughs> um, so to date, this project has opened, has added 24 houses and 174 beds on top of the state contract in the Trillium catchment area with a total investment of over $2.4 million so far. So, 
so so that that 2020 contract was five years. It ended 2020. It was going to end June 2020. I think we were up to 18 houses um, by March of 2020. We did um, a super exciting collegiate open house right down the road from East Carolina University. We all gathered to do the open house. We were all excited. It was the first one in the eastern part of the state. And then the next week, everything shut down um, because of the pandemic. <laughs> I think our contract was too short, but um, from the 20, but in true Oxford House fashion, they pushed through and ended up getting those two houses by the end of that summer, even in the middle of something that we had no idea any of us knew what we were doing in the middle of the pandemic. So um, we have a total of 17 men's houses. One is the collegiate house I just mentioned, five new, ho new houses for women and two women with children houses. Um, we opened up a women with children's house in Greenville, which I think may have been the first one in the eastern part of the state. That was really exciting for me. I think we had a new baby like within in the house within like a week after we opened that one. So that was super exciting. Um, Trillium uses county funds to support this project. And I always think the funny and most ironic part of this is it's liquor tax that we use to support this entire project. So I just love that. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> so the partnership between Trillium and Oxford House um, has really expanded the concept of recovery. Um, it's it lo what it looks like, but most importantly, that recovery is possible. Our relationship with um, Oxford House has even helped our clinicians within Trillium, who have years and years and years under their belts, um, you know, counseling, substance abuse, whatever. They have learned so much. Oxford's house has said, you know, recovery is possible. This is what it looks like. We can live together. We can make this happen. So thank you for that because y'all make it so much easier for me to do my job. This is our Greenville Women with Children's House. This is our first collegiate house. And I didn't have any pictures of the inside, unfortunately, because this house is gorgeous. I love this house. And this is us at that collegiate house. And when I looked at this slide, I was like, I'm wearing the exact same clothes as I was. <laughs> yeah. That was pre-pandemic, so I did that gain 30 pounds, lose 30 pounds. So I don't have any clothes other than pre-pandemic clothes. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, next up, we have Ivory Wilson, who is the program manager at the Office of Behavioral Health in the Department of Health with the state of Louisiana. Help me welcome him. Yeah, so this would be real quick. Everything they said. <laughs> and seriously, most oftentimes, states uh, duplicate or mirror some of the same efforts with some special nuances based upon regions and access to funding sometimes, but for the most part, um, yeah, we are pretty much mirroring some of our attempts at uh, what we're trying to do to enhance the recovery community. Um, I feel real comfortable now. My boy Zach just walked in, so he's from Louisiana. Um, before I was looking out, I'm like, I don't recognize anybody. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. All right, all right. All right good deal. So uh, one of the things that I, kind of thought about when we were coming up with ideas for this presentation was that state governments are notorious for operating in silos. And so we at the Louisiana Department of Health, Office of Behavioral Health, we often see that there are a number of different individuals that pass through different systems. And so when we started looking at it, um, Louisiana was like, okay, we have all these people that are going throughout the treatment facilities, but they're also inundating emergency rooms, they're inundating the Department of Education, Department of uh, Children and Family Services. And one thing that really holds close to me is the Department of Corrections. Um, I have a, we have a partnership, the state of Louisiana does, with the Department of Corrections. Um, Louisiana, we're known for like a lot of famous things. We got the best food. I don't care what y'all say in Seattle, we got the best food. <laughs> we have the best festivals, we have all that stuff, right? Um, but unfortunately, uh, the caveat to that is we also led the nation in prison incarceration rates. 
uh, with the current administration, Governor Edwards, who Laurie had a chance to meet. Y'all know Laurie Holtzclaw? So Laurie was like, she didn't, they didn't have to get us to buy into to Oxford House. We already knew that Oxford House worked. Um, I've been with the contract for at least 15 years, um, but I got to be honest and tell you, I've been in the field as a therapist and as an administrator for 32 years, and prior to me taking over the contract, I had no idea what Oxford House was. And so Laurie got a chance to meet the governor at a meeting probably about two or three years ago, and he uh, committed to her that the next conference or whatever meeting we had, that he would show up, and he did. So that was a big time thing. Um, but again, the working in silos has impacted us significantly. And so um, one of the things I'm proud of is that with the Louisiana Prison Reentry Initiative, LAPRI, um, I'm the chair with that subcommittee. And so because we incarcerated 39,000 people, um, not totally incarcerated, 39,000 individuals in Louisiana were involved in the criminal justice system by way of probation, parole, and in, uh, being incarcerated. And so the government wanted to look at ways that we can reduce that number and be more popular about something else as opposed to locking people up. And so with that, uh, these different state agencies were, they had to allocate certain funding to this initiative to say, hey, we're serving the same people on a revolving door over and over and over again, so how can we change that? So Laurie, Zach, and I have gone out to some of the reentry facilities where we do these presentations on mental health and substance use services that are available for individuals that are returning back to society. And I got to thank Curtis for that. I don't think he's here now. I see Keith in the back. I had these antiquated, archaic ways, and it's how state government works, of describing people who are returning back to society. You know, people use words like convicts and whatever other said. And the third, and Curtis kind of pulled me aside in D.C. and he was like, man, returning citizens, people that are coming back home, your neighbors, your friends, your family. So I've adopted that terminology as opposed to the antiquated way we used to describe people coming out of institutions. And so we wanted to find ways to make sure that people, that when they were coming out, they had a way to transition back into society. So one of the things we started doing, we started diversifying our funding streams. Um, well, let me just give you this data first. I think we have 161 houses statewide, 102 men's houses, uh, 28 women's houses, uh, 28 women with children's houses. Um, Three men in children's houses. Uh, I think, Zach, you started the first one, I think, in Alexandria, if I'm not mistaken. All right. Um, so there are 15 cities throughout the state of Louisiana. And don't be misled by that. It's only Baton Rouge, New Orleans, and Shreveport that actually exist. Everything else is never heard of. Uh, <laughs> got a total of 1,202 total beds, 700 men's home beds, rather, 222 women's beds, 197 women with dependent children's beds. 26 men with children's beds. Um, of course, we know that the opioid crisis has adversely affected how we do business. And for the longest, people had this abstinence-based model. You know, Even from the frame of thought I came from, from being in the fear early on, it's like, you got to get clean and that's it. We know with the opioid epidemic, this is just not so true. There are people who have uh, opiate use disorders who may require MAT. I look at it as if a person who's uh, insulin dependent, if he has diabetes, would you tell him not to take his insulin? If a person has hypertension, would you tell him not to take his low pressure? Um, if a person was ca had cancer, would you tell him not to do radiation? And so with that, we had to kind of relook at the way we did things in terms of houses in Louisiana. And I guess this is something that also occurred nationwide. I remember a conference in DC where I think Dr. Gitlow and Paul were kind of taking um, their chances, their turns at the podium. And I can tell it wasn't something that Paul was increasingly like, um. But Stuart, Dr. Gitlow, got up and did a real good job of motivating him, showing him how evidence-based practices prove so in this situation as well. Um, and so we have 144 residents on MAT. More impressively, more impressing rather, the abstinence rate is at 93% in our Oxford houses in Louisiana. So, um, I'm really running through this because the caveat of being last, uh, you got to just bundle up everything. And I got like 45 slides that I just want to just bore you with, but <laughs> I won't have that opportunity. Um, Let's see, we used ATR funds initially to support the initiative, but fast forward, we started using um, some SAPT block grant funds. 
The base contract is about 249000 which is not a lot of money. But uh, Kathleen was real adamant about making sure we got more funding to Oxford. So we started, uh, because of the opioid epidemic, and it's, I guess this is fortunately and unfortunately, we were able to secure a lot more funding because of the opioid crisis. And so we took those funds and we kind of maneuvered them and did some fuzzy math with them. We were only supposed to be using them for opioid treatment but we got a chance to realign some of those funds. We changed the scope in the grant, and so we were able to allocate funding, uh, because again, we had that large prison, uh, the prison population in Louisiana. So we came up with this stipend that we use for individuals returning back to the community. We'll pay their rent for the first three months. Um, we'll also help them with startup funds. So each new house, even though we don't have the revolving loan anymore because Katrina destroyed that, we lost a lot of stuff because of Katrina, and so, we couldn't get that thing right sized, and so we wound up forgiving the loans completely. Uh, but we couldn't re implement it because we were such in a hole with it. But we were able to secure this new funding through SAPT funds, um, the COVID emergency grant, um, even though there's a lot of stuff about women independent children's programs. We were able to allocate some of these funds to increase our outreach workers, and I think we have nine in the state now in Louisiana um, that cover the state. Um, we had the honor of having Lori as our regional person, but now she's ascended to some new heights I heard earlier. She got like this new title or something. Can't touch her now. Um, we used the Lasoa funds. Uh, I know initially when I first inherited this contract 15 years ago, we only had about uh, like $249,000, and it was probably, I want to say maybe 60 houses. I should have used the demographics to show that, but now we're well over 100 now. Um, but because it is diversified funding streams, you're able to, like with this American uh, Recovery Rescue Plan Act, um, we're able to start like 20 new houses uh, each year. It's so a three year, two year, I think the funding is two or three years, I can't recall. Um, but it equates to about $5,000 uh, per new house. It's not a, you know, like a million dollars or anything, but it's evidence that any money can help. And so we're able to open new houses with those funds. Let's see, I made a couple of quick notes. Uh, let's see. With some of that funding, also, we're able to secure Narcan kits. With those kits, there's one responsibility that we have the outreach workers do is that they go out and they conduct trainings on how to administer Narcan. Um, and so they use that funding to also uh, do trainings within the community, uh, drug courts, hospitals. Um, we work closely with our peer support specialist groups in our office who actually go out and they assist uh, outreach workers whenever possible to kind of help them navigate through that whole process. That's just the amount of funding that we've had in the past three years for the Oxford House contract. And I'm trying to move without the moderator start throwing out numbers and he just threw out the numbers. Let me see. <laughs> yeah. yeah, opioid effects, no I can, blah, blah, blah. And this is just some other information about uh, some of the kits that we have available. And I think with the funding that we receive, we're able to allocate at least 10 kits to each house. And it's, it's not a lot of kits. And we know that relapse rates are extremely high with this new fentanyl stuff out, car fentanyl and heroin already being 65% more potent than it's ever been. So we, we're needing more Narcan kits, I think, than we've ever needed before. I heard one of the previous panelists mention that um, in their state, the state was moving toward uh, attempts to certify or license uh, recovery homes. And of course, because of the rampant misappropriation of funds and misuse of houses and people just pulling up these mom and pops homes all over the place and it just don't work out to the advantage of the people they try to serve. Our state legislature is also looking at ways to try to certify them. They hadn't done it yet because Basically, uh, the agency in our office is only responsible for certifying licensing residential treatment facilities or people that provide treatment services. Oxford is not that model, but it's also pretty evidence-based. Um, the one thing I just wanted to conclude was that um, while I don't have lived experience, I'm not in recovery, um, I do have some personal experiences. I had two brothers that overdosed uh, from speedballing. I had two brothers that died of alcohol-related deaths that were actually preventable. I currently have a brother who's doing life in prison. He has hepatitis from shooting up heroin for over 30 years. Um, friend that overdosed on and on and on. And growing up in the New Orleans community, there are a lot of people I know that were adversely affected by opioid overdoses and things of that nature. I didn't know anything about Oxford houses. 
And so a lot of them didn't know anything about Oxford Houses. Um, I just wish that there was an opportunity for the people that were adversely affected in my life to be able to have access to what you all are experiencing now. And I think one of the other parents mentioned also about coming to these, um, these conventions. It's like super cool for me because it's like to be able to see that many people that are enjoying being in recovery, that are sober, that are alive, you know, it, it gives me hope for the people that I continue to serve. Again, I think about my brothers daily. I'm kind of like a, I don't know what, what you would refer to it as, but I got the obituary still sitting in the corner or whatever as if they're gonna come back or something. But it's just, I think about the connection that it, what I have in the field that I do, if I had those resources for them at the time, if I had knowledge about it, they may have still been here, but um, part for the course, I guess, for lack of a better way of describing it, there are people who I can still affect by the funding that we use in our state to try to enhance recovery support services by way of Oxford Houses. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Ivory. Um, so I just wanted to say, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, you hear the numbers and the work and everything that's going on in the states of the panelists that are sitting up here. I know you kind of hear about, you know, what, what, it, what Oxford House started with the first contract or the second contract. Um, and today, you know, Oxford House Inc. partners with 24 different states with 65 different contracts, whether that's with state agencies, you know, recovery, recovery uh, community organizations, private contracts um, all over the country to help expand and, and expand the number of Oxford Houses, network, uh, make sure that we keep, you know, being able to train but there's still so much, so much more work to do. I mean, that's that's really we hear these great numbers and the number of houses, but you know, we we still we still got a lot of work to do, and 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 a lot of places that don't have the opportunity of Oxford House um, that that those of us sitting here do. So um, we definitely want to make sure that we open up a little bit of time. We got about ten minutes for questions. So if you can just make sure, I don't know if we have a floor mic that's going around. We're gonna use this one up here. So if Mike, Michael McKeo, could you? And if you guys could direct your question to who you'd like to answer it, and then we will have them come up to the podium and answer your question. So just raise your hand. If, if you don't mind just trying to you know stick through the rest of this panel without a bunch of people getting up and leaving because it's gonna open the door and we wanna make sure that people can hear the questions, so. Uh, my question is for Amy. Uh, my question is for Amy. Um, I don't know if I missed it, but do you have, is there any current funding through Trillium for North Carolina? Yes, yeah, sorry, I was sitting here thinking about that. Um, yeah, that five-year contract is now an annual contract with the goal of opening four houses per year. So we continue on with, yeah, building on that initial contract. Thank you. Hey, Ivory. Um, quick question. Uh, when do you think and, and who is trying to uh, make legislation to certify houses? Because there are real house, there are real problems in Baton Rouge with some of the sober houses that are open. And, and, and you know, it's not like on the Florida scale that was Florida, but, you know, they, there are some, some, some shady organizations in Baton Rouge in particular. So uh, Representative Barrow, Regina Barrow, uh, she's actually a super supporter of Oxford Houses. She's just not in favor of these mom and pops houses that are just popping up all over the place. They're using these structures or whatever you want to refer to them as. It's just places to uh, kind of almost like circle through people through like cattle. There was one particular provide in Louisiana. I can't think of the name of the, uh, the outreach, I mean the, uh, the recovery, sober living home that it was called. But he had this ability to open up an outpatient program, a small residential program, and he started working with these insurance companies. And he would actually, from what I understood, uh, drug dealers would actually go to the houses. People who've been in recovery, these people relapsed, they go back through the system, and these insurance companies had these relationships with them. They were like cycling them back and forth and through. But Representative Barrow is like, she's a real star supporter of. Um, Oxford Homes. I actually was a, had a chance to appear on the radio show probably about 
three or four months ago, it was some type of recovery initiative that was going on. And when I spoke about Oxford Houses, she knew about them and she was like, yeah. And so we want to keep Oxford House at the forefront and try to get some of these people out that are just in it to make a profit. And so there's no licensing standards in our state. Uh, the only facilities that are licensed are treatment providers. And so they haven't come up quite a way to figure out a way of managing some type of monitoring system that just to prevent those um, not so good role players that are coming into the state. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Kelly. Um, I'm from Texas. I'm not sure who I need to direct this to, but I'm on the reentry board uh, with my chapter. I am wondering the pro the problem that I keep running into on getting some of the pro lees into the houses is that we have to be on this list. Do you know what this list is, and how I could get that done? So we ran into this as well uh, in the state of Kentucky, and what we even found was while there may be, sometimes it even seems like this list is almost, uh, how can I say, really fictitious. Like sometimes it would be like a different area had a different list of houses. Um, but one thing um, that I would advocate for is finding those commute, like the, the folks in those regions specifically, instead of maybe going, if you've gone about it like the statewide way, um, address each region. Um, and then in the state of Kentucky, uh, we have Brent Welsh, uh, who's working, is Brent in here? No. Um, Brent is actually our outreach worker that focuses specifically on reentry and building those relationships uh, with our Department of Corrections. Uh, I've, been, I've even been saying it for years. You know, we talked about doing inreach in our, in our correctional institutions in the state. Oxford House was doing inreach before anybody even said inreach. We were going in, we were meeting with people, doing the interviews before they even came out. And then if they didn't have anybody else to pick them up, our outreach staff would go pick them up when they got released and take them directly to an Oxford house. And so I, rather than try to answer your question, I commiserate with you that that is definitely the case. And while there probably is a physical list, it seems like it's gonna be different in every region. So I would approach it regionally if you can. But I would also uh, ask you to reach out to some of the other outreach staff in, in other states, Brent, uh, as well in the state of Kentucky, and get some direct um, relationship with them uh, and partner with them on the models that they use. I know o Oklahoma, I think, was another one that did an exceptional job in doing uh, reentry work. So. I know the Department of Texas Corrections Department of What we did in the now, we went straight to the source. And so we have a real great relationship with the Department of Corrections. And so I actually, there's like a household name. The only issue that we've had, we don't have a list per se, but we have a particular problem with certain populations of focus, for example, sex offenders. Real sensitive area, topic, people, and so they can't go into auction houses, so that's been a problem. But also, um, there's a disproportionate number of, some racial disparities, and so what probation and parole has really got on our time about and try to increase auction's awareness, and I'm sure you guys are aware of it, there's just not enough diversification, I guess, in terms of like the people that are in prison that are coming out. And so they were trying to figure out a ways to do more. DOC encouraged us to do a better way of, um, to get to those ground roots efforts, to go to those places where minorities or African Americans, whoever exists, to try to get more because whenever, you know, they would have like a problem, they were like, hey man, that's not a, this is basically what the, the secretary for the Department of uh, Corrections said. There's not enough black people in Oxford. I don't ever see any black people in Oxford. I'm like, well, I don't think that's true, but there are some. But I know in Louisiana there was just a disparaging amount. And so they always work close with us, the Department of Corrections. So I will go to the source, if you can, in the Department of Corrections in Texas and figure out if there's an ally that you can, can partner up with to try to figure out how we can get rid of that imaginary list. So. I've got a question. So um, this is hot, ain't it? Wow, Robert Turner. So when I'm um, when I'm talking to different uh, professionals recovery community, they're asking if we're um, if you know if we're certified or not. And of course, I have to tell them that um, that we're not that we're exempt, right? And I tell them about Oxford House, how long we've been around. How can I better answer that question? Okay. Um, so in the state of Kentucky, uh, we 
somebody else had just talked about part of uh, having some partnership with the National Alliance of Recovery Residences. Uh, and so one thing to keep in mind there is while Oxford House does not certify, the National Alliance of Recovery Residents does recognize Oxford House as an appropriate level one model. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we've done. We've recently uh, created an R affiliate in the state and we don't certify uh, level one houses. We let Oxford House handle that. And so that's, that's how we've kind of navigated that process. So in Tennessee, as of July the 1st, we were um, tasked with Right, so in Tennessee, the legislation uh, mandated that we have to keep a list on our website, both uh, the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services and the Department of Correction. And so we link Oxford Houses on our website. We link NAR, uh, in Tennessee it's 10R, actually, and then the Department of Correction, and then we also list all of our transitional living houses that we have any oversight over. And then the Department of Correction also has to keep that list on their website. Any other houses that do not fall under that then have to put this sign in their window basically saying we're not affiliated with anybody. So, I don't know. Okay, real quick, thank you uh, for that. Just as if anybody didn't hear what Keith said, if you ever do get that asking about, um, you know, certification of an Oxford house, what he said was, you know, Oxford houses are chartered and um, Oxford House has that chartering process. So we're gonna go ahead and this ends the first session. You're gonna have about a 15 minute break and then please be back in the next panels uh, for the second breakout session. Thank you.